Getting EU leaders to sign off the Brexit deal is the easy bit. The real battles will start back at home. And a one backbencher who might prove decisive is the former Conservative Party leader, Ian Duncan Smith, uh, who joins us uh, now. Thank you very much for being on the show. So, good morning. So, first things first, just to be clear, can you support Theresa May's deal? Well, I haven't seen the final bit of the deal and whether anything's changed or not, but what I saw uh, over the last week and a half to two weeks makes it very, very difficult for somebody like me to support this deal. <clears throat> it seems to me that uh, far too much has been given to the European Union and far too little seems to ally itself with our commitments, both at the Lancaster House speech, which she made, uh, and more importantly, in some senses, the manifesto pledge we made uh, at the last election. And those were very clear that we'd take back full control of our laws, our borders and our money. And there are real issues uh, in this. The number one issue, of course, is the backstop uh, in Northern Ireland, which cedes huge amounts of power to the European Union, both to the Court of Justice, but also for the very fact that the Northern Ireland will be treated differently from the rest of the UK. And we will be stuck, if we go into the backstop, uh, in the customs union, obeying all those rules and regulations. So there are many other issues as well, but those, those are uh, immediately what were in the paper and don't appear to have changed. There's another one too, Sophie, which is quite important. Uh, I was looking again at the report and I noticed that in the area where the government talks about ending freedom of movement, I have to say, having written a paper on this, I don't really think that's correct because it now talks in there, buried in there, that there would be social security coordination between us and the EU. I think when you strip out the language, what that actually means is that we are prepared to cede to uh, citizens of the European Union an almost immediate right to claim benefits. And this has caused huge damage to many, many on low incomes who are competing with them when they find that they come in on very low salaries and claim all the benefits. I mean, it cost for those on low income, for the UK taxpayer, it cost us about 500 million pounds in the last year of record. So these are very, very big issues and questions whether we okay. really are going to seriously think about ending freedom of movement. <coughs> I just want to really pin you down on the specifics of my question. You say it's be very difficult yeah. to support the Prime Minister's deal. As it stands, will you vote for it or against it? Uh, I certainly won't be voting for it and I'm more likely to vote <coughs> against it. But as I say, I'll see what comes back if anything's changed. I don't believe anything much has changed. In fact, I think there's one area which makes it even more difficult, which is that we seem to have ceded the right of Spain to have a say over what Gibraltar's future trading relationship will be, whether it's exactly the same as the UK's. Now, that's being dressed up a bit, but the reality is when you peel it away, Spain is now saying that they have a major concession. And I seriously wonder whether, if that is the case, uh, we haven't also, in a sense, abandoned Gibraltar as well as we have abandoned so many other things in the course of this negotiation. <clears throat> OK, I mean, and number 10 are denying that. They say that it's not a, a concession, <clears throat> it's just a, a restatement of uh, what was already uh, agreed. But I just want to take a quick step back because the deal on the table uh, proposes that we would end uh, free movement of people. It says that, uh, you know, they hope to be able to uh, conduct uh, their own uh, trade deals. Uh, they hope uh, that the uh, backstop in Ireland will never come into force and that there may be technological ways of solving that border problem. So I know it's not perfect, it's not exactly what you wanted, but don't you have to compromise? I mean, surely this is the kind of deal where Eurosceptics a few years ago would have bitten the PM's arm off to get. Well, not really, no. And uh, you say compromise, but uh, we have compromised. Many of us have compromised. You know, when you think back to it, back in December, where I think it all went wrong, uh, we were persuaded at the time to compromise over the fact that we gave the EU a commitment to 39 billion, uh, and also we agreed to this ludicrous backstop, which is very damaging to the union. Now, that was all done on the basis that it wouldn't be legally binding and that we would immediately move to trade negotiations, which would then complete before we had to vote on all this. Well, we never did move to trade negotiations, and they are binding. As you see now in the withdrawal agreement, the only binding legal text is the withdrawal agreement. And in it, you have uh, the backstop, and it's bound in that we will pay them 39 billion. Not hinged on whether we get a trade deal, it's bound in. And so the big problem is there have been major compromises made, and we fully understand, I fully understand, you need 
to compromise. But to compromise and give away all of the important things that the EU wants without actually getting anything other than a general statement about what might happen to us is really, really damaging. And let me just come back to this backstop, Sophie, because it's really, really important. At the backstop, we are assured now by the Prime Minister that the EU does not want us in the backstop. We are assured uh, that uh, we don't want to be in the backstop. In fact, the Chancellor says it's a terrible, terrible mess, the backstop. Uh, and we are told, categorically now, because the Irish say, they will not ever, ever have a hard border, regardless what the deal is. So if all those assurances are that we will never go into the backstop, why in hell's name is the backstop sitting as a legal text, which means if we leave without any agreement, without a future trade deal, we are bound to go into the backstop, or they will force us into an extension of the implementation okay. period, which will cost us you know, tens and tens of billions of pounds. So I really don't think okay. that it's any good to give us reassurances when we should have these bound into the withdrawal agreement. Um, briefly, Mr Duncan Smith, because we are uh, running out of time, uh, Dominic Raab, the former Brexit secretary, suggested uh, that the deal on the table is worse than remaining in the EU. Do you share his view? What would be worse, staying in the EU or adopting the deal on the table? Well, I don't want to stay in the EU. I campaigned to voted to leave the EU. I don't believe that so far this deal uh, delivers on what the British people really voted for. Uh, you know, take back control of your borders, your laws, your money. I think it has ceded too much control. I believe the government needs to go back and say things like the backstop. We simply cannot agree it, and you must take all of that reference out and things to do with the Court of Justice. That would make this a better deal. But right now, the balance is definitely tilted against this being a deal, I'm afraid, that delivers on what the government said they would deliver, which is leaving the European Union and setting out to be able to do our own trade deals. We won't be able to do our own trade deals if we're bound into the customs union. That is single one of the most important things that people voted for. Uh, and just uh, finally, Mr Duncan Smith, uh, we heard this week, didn't we, that the uh, prominent Conservative uh, MP and Brexiteer John Hayes uh, was to be given a knighthood. Lots of speculation uh, that this was uh, you know, dealing by uh, number 10. I just wondered, uh, does the fame ring ringing for you, uh, Sir Ian Duncan Smith, perhaps that would make you back the deal? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a great deal. This is not April's Fool, is it? Um, can I just say, when it comes to John Hayes, he's an old friend, and he's been a loyal, he's been a loyal minister uh, of a government, and I have to say, he deserves a knighthood. I'm over the moon and very happy for him and his wife, Susan, and I give them my fullest congratulations, as do, by the way, all of my colleagues. He's a really good man, and, uh, and I think if, you can't, if we can't accept generously that a reward is given to a good, decent person, then I think that says less of us. I'm absolutely over the moon about it. But there's nothing for okay, me. Um, <laughs> in, Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in Douglas Smith, thank you uh, very much for being with us this morning.